one of the more outlandish attempts to improve and update conventional steam locomotive design, Bulliard's leader project was an innovative scheme that was based on sensible principles, but the resultant locomotive would prove to be a thoroughly flawed machine with too many ingrained issues to ever make it a viable piece of rolling stock, despite the underlying promise the leader had set out to fulfill. One of the most pervasive problems of the railways have been efforts to improve the efficiency of steam locomotives, a task to which the Southern Railway's Oliver Bulliard proved to be one of the most progressive designers, having famously introduced a series of innovations, including his light Pacific and Merchant Navy 462s with chain-driven valve gear and his bare-bones but practical Q1060 goods locomotives, while his developments in boiler design and with wheels included the Bulliard Firth Brown wheels which abandoned spokes and were claimed to be lighter and stronger than conventional equivalents. As for the development of the leader, this would originate from a meeting held in December 1944 to consider the Southern Railway's locomotive building program. And while there was no disagreement among the management on the proposal to build 25 more light Pacific locomotives, Bulliard also suggested a further 25 of the Q1 class, for which the materials were ordered and available, though traffic manager RMT Richards preferred tank engines. His rationale was that the Q1s were not suitable for regular tender first running, as the rear lookout on the driver's side did not give a sufficiently wide range of vision, and the absence of a lookout on the fireman's side was a serious drawback, while also questioning whether they were suitable for maintaining the necessary speeds when running tender first and with a light load of coal and water, a matter that Bully had agreed on. Therefore, on January 4th, 1945, the joint recommendation of Bulliard and Richards to the Southern's general manager, Sir Eustace James Missenden, was for 25 passenger tank engines to be built from material ordered for the 25Q1 class, 10 shunters, and 25 West Country passenger tender engines that would utilize for the tenders the material ordered for the 25Q1 class, though Missenden, in response, stated that they should build 25 mixed traffic, 25 freight, and 10 shunting engines, which left the Q1 material to be used as originally intended. Meanwhile, exploratory work was being undertaken in the Chief Mechanical Engineer's Department for adapting the Q1 to a tank engine, first as an 062, then as an 064, which, due to it being around twice as powerful as an M7 class tank engine, would have found great favour, but Bulliard found the design unimpressive and was more interested in a compact locomotive on two power bogies, based on a proposal he had made previously. He was, however, persuaded against the idea, and instead proceeded with experiments in duplicating the driver's controls of the Q1 so that the driver could operate from the fireman's side when running in reverse gear, with locomotive number C36 being used for trials, and was coupled to a light Pacific tender to make a number of high-speed runs between Ashford and Maidstone, which resulted in a proposed double-fronted version of the Q1. The running department, however, immediately opposed the notion and thus Bully had considered instead a 262 tank and 264 tank, followed by a 464 tank, all of which used the Q1 boiler, though this would lead to the double bogey concept again, with all 12 wheels driven, as based on an idea Sir Nigel Gresley had looked at in 1928 for a multi-cylinder geared locomotive, which would provide far superior adhesion, while a sleeve valve engine was proposed due to potential weight reductions but increased efficiency, all of these ideas eventually being put to one side, and attention reverted to a 464 tank design with a 350 psi boiler. Come 1946, a year had passed since the agreement to build more locomotives, but still nothing had been decided for the 25 tank engines, with the traffic department demanding a new tank engine of considerably more power than the M7 class tanks, while the government could not make up its mind on the question of coal or oil as the future of fuel for the British locomotive fleet. However, while the main opponent to the double bogey proposal was absent, Bully had pressed ahead and produced a drawing for an 0440 in February 1946, but the projected weight was found to be far too great at around 20 tons per axle, and thus he considered that with a different boiler and six-wheeled bogies, the weight problem could be cured, and he declared the project, called the Type CC locomotive, to be the next steam project. The first feasible design was produced in April 1946 and took the form of a rigid light Pacific with the locomotive and tender all in one piece, with Bulliard writing to Missenden in July 1946, advising him that the proposed new locomotive would meet the traffic manager and civil engineer's requirements, would have a top speed of 90 miles an hour, would work any train that a Q1 or light Pacific could work, could operate 80 miles before acquiring water and 150 miles without taking coal, and would run over all the southern railway routes with the exception of just eight lines. The expected cost for a batch of 25 engines was forecast to be £17,000 each, 
whereas to build a one-off prototype would have been in the region of £25,000, and thus a meeting was held on September 4, 1946, to discuss what was initially known as the leading class shunting locomotive CC type, for which a new drawing was produced, but still of a design reminiscent of a light Pacific incorporating a tender in the body of the locomotive. At this stage, though, no decision was taken, due to a case being made that to commit to more than five of these new engines would be foolhardy, that the following day, Bulliard was given permission to proceed with the construction of five engines to the latest drawing, with the order being placed with the Brighton Works on September 11th of the same year. Richards justified the decision in a letter to Missenden the following day, on the basis that the most powerful passenger tank engines on the western section of the Southern's network were outdated and inefficient M7s which prevented any improvement on the services they operated, and had already been condemned to be withdrawn as early as 1950, thus requiring 60 new tank engines of either steam or diesel, in addition to the 25 already proposed, and that the building of the first five will be a guide as to the construction of the remaining 20. Enthusiasm for the new locomotive was now running high, but Bulliard was still troubled by the problem of the driving position, and thus he took a leave from the cab forward AC-12 steam locomotives of the Southern Pacific in the United States, as built in 1943 and 1944, which presented a design that placed a covered cab over the end of the boiler, and thus allowed for operations through tunnels without being unpleasant or obstructive to the engine crew, and were particularly famous on the Donner Pass route in California. The leading class was of a similar concept, and would incorporate an integrated design of a driving position at either end, connected via a through corridor, with the boiler, coal and water space being provided on a common rigid frame, mounted over two power bogies, with this form of articulation having been widely used on locomotives such as the Bayer Garrett designs, but would dispense with a conventional valve gear in favour of a chain-driven system. One concept was to have an interchangeable power bogey, although it would require a fleet of 30 engines to justify holding spare bogies to keep the engines in service when their bogies needed an overhaul, and with the Southern Railway being at the forefront of welding technology on Britain's railways, it was natural that this technique would be used to the maximum, with the all-welded boiler containing 36 large and 283 small tubes, and the firebox contained four siphons welded at the bottom of the barrel and the underside of the firebox drum. The blast pipe had five jets, and TIA water treatment was included, while the fitting of flexible steam pipes gave the power bogies the ability to negotiate curves down to five and a half chains, while the boiler gave no problems and could steam exceptionally well, though the firebox firebrick linings were very troublesome, and in order to assist with cleaning out the smoke box, a permanently opened duct was fitted with a cover worked from the cab, which got rid of most of the ash. In practice, though, this impaired steaming and was abandoned, while sleeve valves were incorporated, as by eliminating the piston valve, they made it easier to fit the engine into the tight space of the bogey, and they allowed for shorter steam passages leading to improved thermal efficiency, while rotary movement of the sleeves was incorporated to reduce wear through improved lubrication, and as a test bed, H1 Atlantic Class number 2039 Heartland Point was fitted with this system, and proved a great success with runs up to 80 miles an hour. The boiler was of all welded construction, but at the rear it dispensed with conventional stays, and instead used the rear of the boiler barrel to form the crown of the firebox, thus meaning a loss of heating surface, which was compensated for by the use of four thermic siphons, while at the front, the smoke box had a multiple jet exhaust system with superheaters, and a heat door mounted on the front, intended to keep the temperature of the front cab down. The coal bunker and water tanks were within the main frame to the rear of the boiler, while underneath were two bogies without conventional valve gear, and which appeared to have giant axle boxes due to the drive arrangements, while electric lighting and other novel features were also fitted. The most striking difference between the leader and a conventional steam locomotive was in the way that it was fitted with an all-over casing, which, when coupled to the driver's cab fitted at both ends, gave it the appearance of a diesel or electric locomotive, while a third working space in the middle between the boiler and the bunker was also provided for the fireman, and was connected to both cabs by a small passageway within the casing, which in turn meant that the boiler was mounted slightly off-centre. While the idea of producing a locomotive that could run equally well in each direction, with exceptional visibility for the driver and superb routability was a good one, the design had various flaws, as during construction, reworking of individual components was needed, and modifications took place even before it steamed, thus leading to attention being concentrated on the first of the batch, with progress on the other four being made slowly as time permitted. 
In this regard, many of the problems involved in the development of the leader could be owed to the fact that Bullion himself spent little time overseeing the project directly, as unlike the design and development stage of the Merchant Navy and Q1 classes, wherein Bullion took full lead of the project direction, he would prove to be a rare visitor to the drawing office during the conception and delivery of the leader. Nevertheless, materials were ordered in December 1946, and construction began in July 1947, with November 1947 having seen a further 31 leaders be sanctioned, but this was in the final run-up to nationalization, and they were never actually ordered. And while there was still a large amount of design work still to be done, the first frames were set up at the Brighton Works during May 1948. The folly of starting work before the drawings were completed soon became obvious, as later ideas were incorporated and errors and mistakes were corrected by burning off or adding on to the welding, which all contributed considerably to the final engine coming out of the works overweight, with problems arising at virtually every stage except the boiler, some exacerbated by the hurry in which the locomotive was being constructed. The triple cylinder blocks were both warped after their finishing machining, due either to insufficient relieving of welding stresses, to being strained whilst welding to the frames, or partially for both reasons, leading to serious issues in driving the sleeves, though the second leader would likely have been far less troublesome through being constructed in far less of a hurry. The first bogey was test run with steam from a nearby shunter and started at only 8 psi and ran perfectly well until one of the crew reversed the engine whilst it was running and buckled several of the motion rods and links. Despite all these setbacks, however, the first leader, 36001, steamed away to its trials in June 1949, but by this point, Bulliard was fully aware that such a novel machine would never see widespread use by British Railways, who sought a new fleet of standard locomotives based on proven designs, and were also beginning early investigations into what would become the 1955 modernisation plan, which would place emphasis on diesel and electric traction. Therefore, Bulliard, in the face of his own position on the newly formed southern region of British Railways being abolished, accepted the position of consulting mechanical engineer to the Irish Railways, and planned to retire from the Southern Railway on September 30th, 1949, though Robert Riddles, member of the Railway Executive for Mechanical and Electrical Engineering, was fully aware that the leader project needed Bulliard in order to succeed, and persuaded him to stay until the end of the year, by which time he fully expected the locomotive to be in revenue service. However, almost immediately, the leader had serious problems, the first emerging in November 1949, when Riddles realised that the fireman's cab became intolerably hot, and would have been highly dangerous during a blowback, while there were also problems of uneven weight distribution due to the off-centre nature of the boiler, which was cured by adding even more weight, this time to the floor of the access passage of the locomotive. Thus, Riddles ordered that work on the second to fifth engines be stopped, while in December 1949, with the locomotive nowhere near ready for traffic, he arranged for Bulliard to stay at British Railways for another three months before departing for Ireland, the engine eventually being made ready in March 1950, with Bulliard writing to Missenden and Riddles on March 8th to convey his satisfaction with the locomotive and that it would be a useful addition to the fleet. However, two days later, Ron Jarvis, an engineer at the Brighton Works, reported that the leader had many shortcomings, being notably too heavy for many of its proposed routes, the enclosure and lubrication of the engines, axle boxes and springs being very unsatisfactory, that its increased steam chest volumes and port areas and the reduced clearance volumes would have a minimal effect on thermal efficiency, and that the fire bricks used to replace the firebox water legs were not successful. He went on to say that the disappointing progress was more to do with the detailed design than the broad conception, adding that self-aligning axle bearings were essential, that the fireman's confined space was dangerous in the event of a blowback, that the valve gear was unsatisfactory on three counts, and that the wheels should have been smaller. Regardless of this damning report, Riddles remained surprisingly committed to the concept and wanted the trials to continue despite the protests of his colleagues, though Riddles, at the time, was taking stock of the wider picture as having just announced the 12 standard designs of steam engine to be built by British Railways that would all be based on the best of existing practices due to the company's low cash reserves, he was willing to pursue any concept that might emerge as successful going into the future. Despite spiralling costs for the prototype, which had risen from an estimated £100,000 in September 1948 to £176,000 in January 1950, the engine was prepared for dynamometer car trials, and that if these showed significant advantages in operation, consideration would be given to continuing to build the remaining engines, but in so doing would have to address the weight problem, 
which, at 124.5 tonnes, was 5.5 tonnes over the weight estimates given to the civil engineer, together with a side-to-side -side variation of 10 tonnes. With the endorsement of the railway executive, the trials of the leader included high-speed runs punctuated by extended observation of any malfunction of the valve rods, while six draftsmen were nearly suffocated due to a freak vacuum caused in Crowborough Tunnel, and at one point the locomotive carried 18 people on the footplate at the same time. While the leader also attracted many visitors, including André Chapelon, who was very interested in the sleeve valves and the four-siphon arrangement. As the trials progressed, various modifications were carried out, such as more clearance to the axle box pedestals, ballast added to one side to correct trim, the firebox lining thickened, the clearance in the liners doubled, the back ring removed from the sleeve valves, and the oscillating gear removed from the valve gear. Though poor steaming caused by the reduction in grate area following the increase in fire bricks was remedied by reducing the size of the blast pipe nozzles, but this led to excessive fire throwing. To correct this, a brick arch was added, but this caused flames to lick around the fire hall door, worsening the fireman's position, and the rocker grate originally fitted was removed and replaced by a drop gate, while in order to alleviate over-travel of the valves, the maximum cutoff was reduced to 65%, but this led to poor starting. While other problems included motion pins corroding in the oil bath, as caused by leaving the engine standing with water in the sump, the brake release time being too long, circlips breaking and allowing motion pins to fall out, and oil being wasted due to the unsatisfactory drive to the circulating pump. Throughout the trials, a major issue was the discomfort of the crew, with the driver's cab ahead of the smoke box becoming intolerably hot, so much so that most of the trials had to be carried out with the locomotive driven from the other end. While aside from the fireman's central position suffering from abnormally high working temperatures, the engine was also very crammed, and was fitted with a door and window on one side only, thus giving the footplateman's union, Aslef, grave concern as the fireman would have no means of escape should the leader derail and roll over onto its left-hand side. The result of all this was a poor report following the dynamometer trials being issued in December 1950, the decision to scrap the whole project being taken in March 1951, when more electrification and diesels were in prospect, and on November 2nd, 1950, the leader made its last ever trial hauling a 480-ton train at its permitted maximum speed of 50 miles an hour. This was followed a day later by its final run to disposal, during which it reportedly reached 90 miles an hour while running light, while the second example, 36002, which was said to be only days away from being completed, never steamed, and 36003 was substantially complete, but never gained its casing with the other two examples being little more than frames. All five units were stored at various locations, including Brighton and New Cross Gate, but were soon broken up, with the demise of the leaders coming to the attention of the national press due to the cost of the project having been £178,000, or £5 million in 2025, with questions raised as to whether this had been a good use of taxpayers' money. The abandonment of the leader program, however, was not the end of the double bogey experiment, as Bully had managed to persuade his new bosses in Ireland to allow him to build a turf-burning version, and thus he placed into service an improved variant of the leader dubbed the CC-1, which was somewhat more successful than the original, and proved to be the last steam locomotive to be constructed for an Irish railway, while British railways, under riddles, continued to build conventional steam locomotives, which didn't solve the problems Bully had tried to tackle in the first place. Although Leader was undoubtedly underdeveloped and never worked a revenue-earning train, it is possible that with further refinement, it might have led to the country being able to continue with steam traction and thereby relying on domestically mined coal for longer than it eventually did. Unfortunately, it appeared that Bully had attempted to incorporate too many novel and untried features in a single design, with the inevitable teething problems all such prototypes endure, resulting in a bold experiment that was worthy of a significant place in the annals of locomotive development and a tantalizing taste of what the final evolution of the steam locomotive could have looked like.